Welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast, coming in your ear holes. October 1st. We smash it 10 yards tonight, please. The buck we call Pickles. That south wind pushing us back to the zag. Better stand on our backs. Set it out. Set it out and see what happens. You on it? Huh? Absolutely drilled in. And boom, is that good buck. We'll get my buck, and then we're gonna go get homie's buck. An urban piece as hell. Got it. Got him. Pickles is dead. Kevin Gates, both kills on hanging hunts. My first public land buck. Nice work, dude. Look at that. Triple brow on the right. I'm digging that. Fucked out October 28th. An absolutely incredible season. Here we go. All right, welcome to the Whitetail Legacy Podcast, and it's turkey time, baby. Whitetail Legacy Podcast, talking about some turkeys. I got my main man, homie, over there. What? He's going to spit some turkey knowledge yeah. right in your face, <laughs> right in your ear holes. I forgot the ear hole. We're coming in your ear holes with turkey talk, guys. We don't. I, I can't miss that. I've been solid on that for like 80 episodes right yeah, now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Let's get into the people that make this possible, and then we'll get into the show. Homie, what you got over there, brother? Uh, we'll kick it off here with Last Breath. Uh, if you guys are looking for a new hunting show to watch, uh, they do have currently seven seasons um, on YouTube channel. And um, getting ready to surely launch our uh, turkey season from last year. I think it's just going to be a massive um killing fest of turkeys in uh, one episode there for you guys to check that out when uh, it's coming out and then um, they have also kindly obliged to share their codes with us for outdoor edge and underwarmer that you guys should take advantage of that underwarmer um, is absolutely no joke and um, a pretty hefty discount for you guys linking that up in the show notes uh, moving on right, here I got right on oh go ahead go ahead okay go ahead. yeah um moving on in here to exodus trail cameras and guys yet again exodus is blowing it out of the water um if you guys haven't heard um they're running their first ever trade up program you can send them any trail camera in any condition let me say that again any trail camera in any condition and get 75 dollars off of their exodus render just use the code UPGRADE at checkout, and they're going to send you a return label for your old trail camera that you'll be trading in. And after they've received it, uh, they're going to send you your brand new Exodus render. So, like, it doesn't make sense, but they're doing it. They're going to take in any camera um, in any condition, and you're going to get $75 off their Exodus render. And then while you're there, you should go ahead and get you a... Uh, a solar panel and a, a lock box and make sure that you got that thing and um when you do buy that you're also going to have that uh, five-year no bs warranty back in that product and um all their products or all the cameras and um you guys are going to be set so take advantage of that yeah got the uh website linked in the show notes as well and i can't believe that uh that's going on yeah blown away by that that deal right there that's crazy man just absolutely blown out of the park it really the camera that you could be setting on. Like we got the dummy cams to make people think there's a bunch of cams around there, but they don't work. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, right. Just one of those that have been sitting on the shelf for three years <laughs> that don't work. You get it's worth seventy five bucks now. Like that's that's an unbelievable <laughs> deal. And uh, to get you like you're trading in a camera that doesn't work for a camera that you have guaranteed for five years. Mm -hmm. You know that's that's a hell of a deal. So and that takes a lot of the the price off of. A new render. I mean, that's yeah. a that's a big, big chunk of money right there. Yeah, you're, so make sure you're to take right in the game that. there. Yeah. All right, I got right on optics this week. Um, I'm going to touch on a couple things. One thing I love about right on is if if you guys are looking at one of their scopes and you're thinking about purchasing it, uh, their website is absolutely filled with a ton of educational videos, pretty much on every scope that they have. Um, a rundown of the scope and then a bunch of educational videos on just shooting, um, how to sight in the scope quicker, bore sighting, a bunch of different stuff that you can go on there um, and write on optics.com. Um, there's a ton of info on there. And if you're on the fence for a new, a new optic, it's really nice to get on there 
run through all the details, see how someone sets it up, see what it looks like on a gun. That's a lot of a lot of steps that you don't get to do when buying an optic from another brand. Um, you actually get to see the setup with the scope and everything. And then I just want to touch on the unlimited lifetime warranty. Um, we're not talking 10 years, 15 years. We're talking lifetime warranty on that product. Um, and it's unlimited. Not a, You hear a lot of people say, well, it's a limited mm. lifetime warranty. It's got to be, we won't cover the labor, but we'll cover the product. No, this is unlimited. Whatever wrong with that scope. They're not going to refurbish it. They're not going to rebuild it. They're not going to put new glass in it. They're going to send you a brand new scope ready to rip. So um, just blown away by that that lifetime warranty that they're offering um, and an all-American uh, veteran-owned company. And uh, moving in here to Next Level Deer Supplements, uh, guys, the spring and summer feed is kicking out of the warehouse. Um, I've already seen people posting pictures of bucks with two to three-inch nubs coming out. Um the time is now to get it going, and remember, you can customize your own palette. Um, that's an available option for from these guys, and uh, remember that they're always looking for dealers. So um, if I were you guys and, and you can feed and you got some buddies that are willing to come in on the price, um, I'd be slinging that right out of the garage if I were you and um, can make out pretty good there. So um, nextlevelwithyoursupplements.com. Yeah, a lot better deal if you buy a palette, and if you're going to be feeding – most of the time, it's going to be a long-term deal anyways, so a pallet's the way to go on that. Um, but yeah, this is the time of the year that fawns are going to be dropping real soon, and uh, it's crazy to think that the bucks are already growing. Out. I know. it's uh, you, got like a, you got like a little bit of a break, but it's really not a break. It's just a year-round, just full circle of whitetail and um, I wish we could feed, because that's something that we would really, we'd really pump it into them to try to I mean, you think 10 inches, that doesn't seem like a lot, but man, if you could get 10 more inches on every buck on your property, like that's a lot. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That's, and then it's just over the years of growth. That's, that's huge. So, well, I mean, are you ready? Well, yeah, before we move on and kind of just wrap up the next level thing, not really part of the ad read here, but uh, we were just at Iowa show with them and we were holding the, the two antlers and, and the density of the two antlers, you know, is just unbelievable. Because they, yeah. you know, they both looked about the same, but you could just tell the density and the weight of the one antler versus the other one, and it was mind blowing. That math goes a long way. Yeah, like I said, math measurement is one of the most underrated measurements in any scoring system that's out there. You get a a real high point skinny tine buck, and it can score higher than a heavy mass low tine buck, but the amount of inches of antler that that thing grew if you measured the whole thing would be astronomical higher you know what i mean but yeah. uh, they need to come out with a new scoring system i don't know how many years we've been saying that they need to come out with like a water displacement scoring system or yeah everybody's where, water like, displace if you got a fat g2 you know what i mean like you got a real fatty on there you're like <laughs> how many inches of bone did he grow here you know like it's i'm getting short changed but um we're not talking about whitetail this episode. We're talking about uh, turkeys, and I'm more fired up for turkeys this year than I think I ever have been for some reason. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, I've kind of been on the because I like I'm kind of like you right now. It's like I'm always really jacked up going into it, and then I kind of peter off. But I, I've been slow playing the build up. But I got people on Snap and people on social. Yeah out there you know roosting birds or out there hunting now and i'm like shit man like i'm ready to go yeah, now your time to shine like yeah. coming up real soon we, real we just soon. got that we got that extra property now i sent her the message on the way down here um i'm in the hotel tonight if you're on the zoom version of this but uh for work and i sent her the message i was like i'm just gonna hit her low-key here about eight o'clock in the morning and she's like yeah sure that is completely fine i'm like lock that in for the season that's perfect (laughs) i said i don't know if there's a lot of turkeys on there she's like well i normally see quite a bit in spring i'm like that's perfect hopefully we get in there it's a gold mine it's not something that we're trying to like uh keep for long term so we can just go in there and and take out some toms is Mm. what i'm hoping so yeah um as we start this i want to hit you with some would you rathers Uh, shout out to last breath podcast for this 
I want to add this in more often. I think this is a good start to get us flowing in the podcast, get us thinking about what we're talking about. Um, so we might add it in more often. So first, would you rather, well, this is not really a would you rather, this is more like a question. What is your go-to call? You're in the moment and you got to, you got to rip a call. What do, what are you going with? Uh, I'm going to go with the raspy old hen, uh, by HS strut. Uh, I've had that mouth call for shit, probably six or seven years. And I was hella chewed on. Hell hella chewed yeah. On. Like the, the, <laughs> yeah. the end is starting to get frayed and, and then I play with it. Um, but I was actually watching a video of a guy calling with on a pot call, you know, and I was like, man, and there, there was a hen out in front of him. And I'm like, if you're trying to call if that to the Tom, you know, and the hen's right there, like she's going to bust your ass if you're out there raw dogging. So I've um, here in the last, you know, quite a few years switched almost solely to uh, mouth call. I'm okay um, with this- it, but nothing crazy. Yeah, I'm I'm more a mouse ball guy too. I'm not really good with it. Um, I do really like a box call if I'm trying to locate a bird. Get mm. that that box call is loud. Yeah, you, know, you can get really get some volume on that thing. Um, but this might this question might pertain more to us than other people. Illinois is broke down into five seasons for turkey, five different tags. Um, so, what is your best week of the season? I I like this upcoming weekend here, this second, third weekend of April, just because uh, you, you get to get out there and, and get after it. But most of my success has been um, the following weekend, the last weekend of April, or the first weekend of May is where I've really um, had better luck actually the killing. The third season? Yeah, the third and fourth season. Yeah, third and fourth season. Okay, and the last one, Spurs or Beard? Beard beard yeah uh, big long beard on them nice all right well let's we more we normally talk deer on here i got some notes i'm sure homie's got some notes wrote down um i think i should start off with my number one and then you should start off with your number one might be the same we'll see like your, your number one if you're going to go turkey hunting what is it what is it going to do so my number one is scouting uh, for a property and it's a lot different than deer scouting like turkeys don't leave a lot of sign you kind of got to just visually see them there run a trail camera and get some idea that they're there um the property that we have the new property that we have this year we know that they're there in the fall we're hoping that they're there in the spring but that's something that we have to figure out if they're there or not um not every property in illinois holds turkeys i mean it's actually to have a really good turkey population in this area it's kind of hard on properties um you either got it or you have none. It's, there's no in between. Um, like Kings, there's no turkeys on that thing. Like no. uh, the Tinas, it was like, ah, maybe, maybe not. Like they were either there or they were not there. So, um, but your piece, they're always there. Like they're always there somewhere. So some people, and I think a lot of that has like, you got to have a creek. I think that's one thing that people miss out on. You have to have some type of place for these birds to gravel. Um, so if you're looking at new property and if that, if you don't visually see turkeys there and that property doesn't have a Creek, I wouldn't knock on that door because more than likely in this area, there's not going to be turkeys. Now honey, Missouri, there's turkeys everywhere, dude. There's turkeys all the turkey population has to be two or three times what it is in Illinois. I mean, you go out in the morning and I've hunted like people that are planting oats on Creek river bottoms, dude. And it's just like 20, 30 gobblers just ripping the most unbelievable thing. And this bowl of this giant oat, oat field. And it's just, it's literally unbelievable how many birds there are. And you'll see like groups of seven or eight jakes come in. It's just insane. You know? And that's something that we don't get to see. Like if birds come in, they're like two, three, like at the max, you know, there isn't like a giant, group of them um besides your place your place your old place is loaded with turkeys yes. man there's Nuts. seven eight nine toms out there man so um i'd say scouting is your number one key if you're gonna have a successful turkey season you got to figure out if the birds are on that property um and like i said in illinois there's there's some properties where there's just never we've never we've had turkeys one time on trail camera on kings that i can remember of in the fall Mm-hmm. And that was just some hens. Other than that, we've never seen a turkey there. 
You know, you know the the place that the giant typical that was coming out on public. Uh, Nick Brown seen a Tom strutting in that field across the road by that old house a couple of days ago. By I'm that, like, by what that, in by the hell? The house in the driveway that we parked at? Yeah. Oh. I'm like, what in the hell was that turkey? <laughs> I'm like, I'm driving past there, bro, because I'll slip in. That's summer coming easy. Wow. But he's like, yeah, there's, a, there's like a eight-inch bearded Tom out there strutting. I'm like, What? He, where, did, where did that bird come from? I was like, you know he like, I, hella far from anything. <laughs> and I, I, I've been sleeping on this spot. I wanted to tell you, not on the podcast, but I'm just thinking about it again. <laughs> Taylor's grandpa owns the pistol field. He owns just the field. Mm. And I don't know if uh, if there's any turkeys on it or not, but if there is turkeys on that, we could set up on that. We'd have to be on the fence line and only kill them out of the field. But that's an option to roost birds. So if I'm not getting anything at the other piece, I might loop through and see if there's anything there. I've never seen a turkey there, but yeah, it's it's close enough to I mean be logical. Yeah, yeah, it's logical that there might be some birds there. And I was trying to think of where that bird would have come from. And we know there's like we've never seen a bird on that public land ever. Uh, just uh, cool. over by the lease, uh, we had that we had one. Oh, did we? Yeah, one. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we did. Yeah. But that that public land isn't open to turkey hunting, which is kind of a shame. Um, if there was turkeys on that place, man, there's enough fields on that place you could reap some birds off that. that and place. rocks, I mean, it'd be yeah, yeah, it'd be crazy. So, all right, what what do you think your? I hope I didn't steal your number one. What do you think your number one is or number two? Uh, it's well, I, I'll just kind of piggyback off what you were saying, but I'll kind of go a different direction. Is like uh, I feel like if you have turkeys in the fall. You're only going to get more turkeys on your property come spring. Uh, I've been talking to my boss because he actually took off today and yesterday and hunted in the morning. And he owns, I think, 80 acres. And he said that he's he's got kind of a, the opposite scenario to where he doesn't have any birds in the fall or even really um, early in the year. But he said about um, after second season, for some odd reason— He'll pick up like anywhere from two to four toms, and I thought that that was pretty interesting to not have nothing, and then when it's go time, like you got um, you got some something to hunt, and then also there's some birds in town um, that I work at, and I've so this is the second year like kind of watching them, and last year I noticed the last week of March. I did not see them birds until after season. It was like late May, early June, and then they were across the road. Um, not saying that they weren't where I was normally seeing them, but I did notice that them birds did move and weren't showing up um, quite a bit there because they're in like a person's front yard right off of a the main drag in town. And, I mean, there's 14 turkeys and they're feeding on the corn for the squirrel feeder, the bird seed right there. Um, so no reason for them to really leave like during season. And the aerial map is like a 80 acre chunk in town. Um, it's got a hell of a cliff on it, but um, that's just kind of like my thing is, you know, if you've got turkeys, I feel like that they're going to um, stay there. I haven't noticed them moving too much, but the, also then I, I've kind of been on a turkey hunting property that has been a little different than I feel like most properties are because it's just loaded yeah, and it's always been loaded. Properties, and your property is different. That property is just different. I've been, yeah. like I said, I've hunted multiple different states and that property is just got kind of, kind of weird, man. There's a lot of the beer, the, the, the birds do weird, weird, weird <laughs> yeah. stuff there, but. All right, uh, getting into my number two, what I think is most important is uh, roosting. A lot of people talk about this. I think this is key. Gives you a really good idea if they're there or not. But saying that, you cannot dictate whether those birds are 100% there if they're not roosted or not, if they're not gobbling at night. Maybe you got bad conditions. It's windy. It's raining. It's cloudy. Um, I, I kind of go back to the Cybolt piece. Those are some fair weather bird 
Um, only gobbling if it's nice out. <laughs> not gobbling in the evening then we go over there and boom there's turkeys there in the morning gobbling um the evening they didn't make a peep you you owl hooted you crow called out you did everything you threw the book at them they didn't gobble at all on the roost and uh i would really like for one of us to kill that old bird that's on that damn piece just so we could stop going there like that thing is yeah I it was I was thinking about that joker here probably uh, it was probably Saturday. I was thinking about that bird out there. I was like, man, that thing is just that it's like the uh turkey version of West Side. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we could have smashed him last year, but not on film. So yeah. we're like, ah, this year I got to go ahead. I thought talked to Garrett and he's like, just smash that sucker. Yeah. I'm not sure you guys. This guy flew hundred and twenty five <laughs> yards out of the roost like a bald eagle just soaring through the open timber and landed 40 yards behind us. I'm like, what in the hell? I've never seen that happen before in my whole entire life. Just gliding out there like a pheasant. Just just gliding out there, <laughs> looking majestic as hell. But yeah, um, rooster birds, um, I have really good luck with an owl hooter late in, the, late in the night like that. You know, try to get an idea. You don't have to know exactly where they're at, but when you're out there and it's nighttime, <laughs> excuse me and you're trying to get set up on these birds the ground can kind of look a little different at night and where you think you heard those birds um you know in the past might look a little different but if you get an idea in the daylight okay they're over there they're gobbling over there 99 percent of the time they're not going to change their roost so you have an idea of where they're at um but like in our area area you have to be aware of bottoms a lot of times those gobblers are tra- those gobblers are travel a long way down that bottom and that bird would be a lot closer. And we've done that in the past where we set up and the bird's like 55 yards away, 40 yards away in the tree. We've been set up forever. And then uh, you're, just, you're just too close to them. So kind of get an idea of where they're roosting and then and go from there. So what, what do you got next? Um, my thing is uh, calling on the limb. This is something that you know, being younger and growing up and getting out there and, you know, you're so jacked up to finally be out there hunting again and you hear them gobble and then you just like kind of start calling like, you know, right away, which is absolutely horrible, I think. And here these last, you know, three, four years, I've kind of really scaled back my calling, um, while they're on the limb, like, uh, you know, it's it's exciting to to get into a conversation with one. I feel like you know, and, and you know, let him know where you're at, let him know you're over there. And uh, but I feel like it it's also um, you know a a bad situation too because you can easily overcall to that bird before he's even gonna take ten steps towards you. And I feel like nine times out of ten, when you do that, they're f- gonna fly down and fly down away from you instead of towards you so i've kind of just really scaled back and um uh year after year i kind of like pinpoint the times that i'm hearing them fly down so i know um you know about 6 15 6 10 6 15 um we're gonna be really close to flying down they've been gobbling for an hour and um or six about 605 and uh so then about 545 is when i'll kind of you know start calling and uh kind of introduce myself into the game and then hopefully he's you know gonna come my way when he flies down but then on on the flip side just like if uh if if you're observing a hen or something and you know she's out there and just going ape shit like sometimes they're they're in the tree going ape shit too and you know, I don't know if that deters one way or the other. It's just kind of my my um, observation and my experience that you know, ca- calling on the limb is it's fun and it's ex- it's exciting, but I feel like it puts you two steps behind before you're even before the game's even started. Yeah, I think that's like that's a perfect. I didn't have that wrote down. But that's a great topic. It's really hard to know. Kind of like I wanted to know I'm here. I want to get them fired up, but I don't know how much to call. And one thing I could say is just 
take that mouth call out of your mouth because it is so easy just to <laughs> take that thing out of your cheek and be like, I'm just going to give them, you know, three more clucks, you know, or, you know, and then you find out you did that 12 times. And um, like that bird that hung up for an hour in the roost, I, I mean, we tried yeah. to even call him down and it, it that was you get into situations like that, you're like, I don't know what to do. So you just, you're calling to him and he flew down and ran the opposite direction. You know what I mean? I, mm-hmm. And every time you call to him, you're letting him know that there's something over there and they're looking that way. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're, they're looking. So a little movement, every time you call, it gives them another chance to catch you moving. That's what I think. So um, that's a great topic. Um, my number third, which was almost number one, um, was knowing your birds seems silly for turkeys but like your birds on your property they kind of do the same thing and it's hard to get in front of them they do the same shit you got to kind of call them off the hens there's a bunch of hens then you go to the cyborg property it's completely different it's normally lone toms mm-hmm. by themselves um they're kind of timid to, to calling then you go to like tina's where there's a whole group of toms they are real easy to call in, real easy to kill. Um, you go to like when I was hunting in Missouri where you get a mixture of stuff, but it's real easy to call in the hens and the toms and only all come together. You just mimic what the hen's doing and she comes in. Um, so I feel like every property's birds are a little bit different and you kind of get to know some of the birds um, over time. Like we, like the cyborg birds. Just, yeah. <laughs> just a badass out there but you know i killed his brother that one year you uh-huh. know and, and other than that like it's just been him out there ripping there's one bird on that property the same damn spot hard as hell to kill like gobbles his you know gobbles his beak off on the roost and and uh then hits the ground and doesn't do anything like it's just silent as hell and, and always heads south hits the ground head south like that's just his go-to so it's really hard to set up because he freaking roosts on the fence line to the south and then he flies that way so i think that's almost a bird that like you got to just set and all day and just call call out in that field and try to make something happen um i'm kind of hoping that we don't hunt that bird this year i'm kind of hoping <laughs> that the other leads just fire and we kind of let that I would real. I would get a lot of gratification if we could kill that thing, though. I would be like, okay, that would feel good. Um, but yeah, knowing your birds, um, knowing where they kind of fly down, and then also knowing kind of where they might be midday, like you know that ten o'clock, eleven o'clock hour. We can only hunt to one here, so just like on this, the other cyborg piece, we kind of know that that isn't really a morning piece, but later in the day, there's a good chance that those birds have floated that way. You know what I mean? So kind of knowing midday to morning, um, kind of where your birds kind of fly down, they got a transition. They kind of, there's the, the middle birds, the far birds and the, <laughs> the east end birds, you know, and the east yep. end birds kind of have a travel, the middle birds kind of have a travel and the west birds kind of have a travel, the groups. Um, so knowing those groups and that's just over time of hunting them is key because you can get in kind of, you already have an idea of what they're going to do just kind of get in front of them and make that move. Um, and it really shines on your property where there's a lot of property. Those birds have done the same thing every time we set up on them. And we're always right on the edge of, of killing, you know, and it's, it's hard to get closer. Yeah. I mean, like we, we could hunt it this year. I'd be like, all right, we're going down to that South corner and we're just sitting there. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to have a shot in the world when they fly down. But 35 minutes later, they're going to all be on our laps, you know, and it's just time understanding what the birds are going to do on your property. Um, and they, they have a pattern of what they do. And I think it's dictated because of what the hens do. The hens have kind of a, a method to their day of what they do. Um, and I think the cyborg birds, they're just looking for a hen. They just get, they look all morning over there. They can't find anything. So they kind of fade South and come back on. And, uh, and you know, they, they're looking for a hen. So the more years you have on a property, just like deer hunting, yeah. turkey hunting, you're going to, you're going to have an idea of what the birds are doing and they're going to become easier to kill over time. So, 
Yeah, I would say the, the last two years, just kind of break it down, what Cody was talking about. Uh, the last two years, two years ago, had a slight communication with trying to film for basically the first time turkey hunting and uh, was on the wrong bird and then went to the other bird and ended up missing. And then last year, we I called a bird in right off the roost and we had Jesse in tow with us and just our, our setup with two camera guys. Jesse was in front of me, which... With a gun, I don't know why we were even doing that. And uh, if Jesse and I were in different places, then we would have killed the, the turkey was two foot from the decoy. And uh, would have so two years, I would say we were, you know, right there. Right there, yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a midday bird down here because this is something that uh, I learned at a very young age. And I was still, I wasn't even uh, actually hunting i was just going along with my dad and uh you know typical scenario where we're hunting and then it kind of dies off eight o'clock like make a move and uh one time we got burned on it we were sitting you know where that road is where them four we had them four toms so we we're sitting on that field in that cove and that's where we set up for the morning and didn't didn't have you know nothing out in the field that's a midday cove all day yeah so we seen we seen two or three toms with a couple hens across the field in the morning and then you know midday we moved over there and i'm not even shitting you 10 minutes after we got set up out come 25 turkeys literally literally eight yards from where we would have been i mean it was you should have seen our mouths would just look at across the field there and that that's also where I learned, like, all right, pick a time when you're going to get down deer hunting, and then you stay 10 more minutes after that. And then it's always 10 yeah. more minutes, you know. Um, but midday bird, I feel like if you can get one struck up and he's gobbling back to you and you think that he's sounding a little closer, I feel like 95% of the time that bird's coming in uh, on a string. And you, you got to be ready. But the hard part to that is finding one and getting him fired up at, you know, 1030. Sometimes around like 9 to 930, what I've experienced is they'll just start gobbling out of nowhere. And you can kind of get a re, a, you know, get them on the radar again and make a move. And then... Um, if you're not really there within like that 10 minute window of them getting fired back up, um, it's going to be very difficult. But if you're out, uh, just walking a field edge or something, hitting the crow call and, um, you know, trying to hit the box call and one hammers back, man, I feel like he's, he's ready to go, you know? And if you can make, if you can make a small move towards him without busting him and then, he's recognized that your calling has moved, which I feel like adds more realism to the scenario instead of just a stationary sound. I feel like he's going to come as long as there's not like a fence or something, yeah. you know, huge obstacle in the way. If if you're in a block yeah. of timber, I feel mm -hmm. like he's coming. I, I agree. I feel like they're kind of searching at that time of the day. You know, they probably lost their hens, their nest in, they're kind of searching for something else. Um, and, they're more able to come in because 95% of the time um, in our, our area, they're roosted with hens. It seems like where there's hens fly down and the turkeys fly down. Like they're the time you got to pull them all to kill them. You know, yeah. There's not a lot of times it's just Tom's alone. You know, um, I had that. I just had my notes. Crow, crow calls OG um, straight, straight out. I just want to put that on this podcast. Um, <laughs> If you have anything in your bag, like you can have one mouth call, just make sure you have a crow call for like 11 p.m. Like that, I bet you a crow call is, I've killed 20 birds off a crow call. Like just hitting that crow call and getting them to gobble back. Like, yeah. And it's really awesome when you get another crow call and like farther away. And then he calls, you're like, oh yeah. And then you're, you're sitting in that range, you know? Uh, but I have that in the notes. Uh, that's definitely something I would throw in the bag. Um, I have like two or three different ones just because, you know, why not? They're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, the oh, the orange the, one? The Shit. One All right. Try the, the green one. <laughs> yeah. The one with the rubber, 
the orange one with a rubber outline, not the hard plastic. That's the that's the that's the that's the ticket. It's got that, that real high pitched yeah, kind of. I would say that is that, the ripper. That's the ripper. That's the first yeah, one we always go to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to that one. That's that's the, <laughs> the good one. You got that real. You got that in the right pocket, right there, right by the shells. You know, right where that thing's at. But uh, uh, another thing I want to mention, kind of the this the second to the last one is get mobile. Um, if shit ain't happening where you're at, like, uh, we have to one to hunt them. So it, it doesn't seem like a lot of time, but if you set in the same spot, that's a long ass time, turkey hunting, especially if stuff ain't happening. So you got to decide when to get up because you never know when a bird's sneaking in on you. We've all been busted by a bird sneaking in late. Um, but not only get mobile, like walk around, but like if you got properties you can drive and like see if anything's strutting in the field, I've killed birds off of driving somewhere and be like oh there's a strutter and you make a move and he's in a strut zone like you know those strut zones like you can drive or you can go in glass somewhere and decide okay damn there's a bird out there i'm gonna make a play on that and if you would have just sat in that spot and called and called and called uh but what what we like to do is kind of hunt you know make them you know call for a while make a giant move scoop out the properties and then come back somewhere and try to call do that long call where we think the best odds are for that that uh midday bird um i know that last breath the guys from last breath have huge success on driving around spotting birds and reaping them um we have a couple of properties that we can do that on cybolts did pick up that um, giant cornfield there to the south where we normally hunt so we have all that now um, that we'll be able to hit, which is like another 200 acre field. Oh, on the backside, on the backside where we almost killed that one last year. Right when you pull into that property, that field that we had to walk past to get to the good stuff, uh-huh. you drove past it. That big field right there, um, where we have that, it's like a giant bowl, and there's all that timber here. So if we hear a bird back in that timber, we can loop around and get on the north side of that timber now. Um, they just bought that field. So nice. uh, that's a really good strut area. Like you could drive by that, see 150 acres of field and mm-hmm. glass it and be like, okay, there's some birds strutting out here. Let's make a play on it, you know? And that's something that we really haven't had the option. Like Brittany's, it's going to be hard to, you know, unless they're out in the field right by the road, it's going to be hard to make a play on that. But uh, um, like I said, hopefully all those birds are there and it's just a slam duck where we ran those Exodus trail cameras where we hunted that cedar tree. Mm-hmm. I can just see it sitting right there. I just hammered one right along that grass road <laughs> yeah. is what I got in my mind. You know what I mean, like that, that area right there is where we got most of the turkeys on trail cam. We have seen them there. Uh, I feel like that's going to be the ticket spot. Uh, yeah, I feel like they're going to be roosted on the neighbors though. I feel, but I feel like that's the way they're going to come. Yeah. Um, yeah, gonna be deep. just just get mobile. Don't settle um, for what the morning hunt. Don't let that dictate what your day is going to be. There's a lot more hours a day. The birds flew off. You spooked them. Whatever the situation is, get mobile. Um, go to another property if you got it. If not, I mean, there's a lot of public land that's open, and you never know. You could be driving along a public gravel road and hit a crow call and strike up a bird. Bam, you're back in the game. So. Don't let a bad morning dictate your hunt and uh, don't be afraid to get mobile. And, and some birds on one property can be hella fired up. Another property, they're just, they're not, they're not fired up that day. So um, it's a lot different than deer hunting. You know I mean? The, the birds are day to day different this time of year. Like you got a really nice day, they're hammering and the next day it's raining. Well, the deer are pretty much going to move the same. If it's the rut, the turkeys, when it's raining and shit like that, they just ain't, cloudy they just ain't feeling it like they are on the bluebird days for some reason so uh i had a note down of making moves and be ready is is what it says and that was more not necessarily per se i like how you brought up going to different properties because that's that's a really good idea and like you said don't let that morning hunt dictate what you do like i don't know how many times i've had a shit morning hunt and then you get that midday going on and then it's like the best turkey hunt you ever been on um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes you, bottom, you know, yeah, sometimes you just got to shut up for two hours, like, and not do anything. Yeah. It sucks, but, and that's the time you could take it and go drive around, like you said. Um, but making moves and be ready is knowing the terrain and, um, like 
I don't know how many times been out there walking around and just like Cody said, you you get busted by a bird and you're like, I didn't hear no turkeys over here gobbling all morning, all day. Um, didn't hear any if he roosted them last night. Like, I don't know how many times, at least a handful, a couple handful of times, be slipping through the timber, making a move, and boom. Next thing you know, freaking strutters 10 yards from me, just around this knob, and takes off. And didn't know he was there because uh, didn't gobble at all. Yeah, it, wouldn't hit the crow call, wouldn't hit the call, nothing. Not, yeah, there, nothing. It just, just hell. Yeah, just out there chilling, doing his own thing. And um, so just, you know, be ready when you're making moves. A um, couple of times we've been slipping through, trying to get up through the property and, you know, come out of a giant creek draw and you got eight turkeys out in the field with two strutters, you know, and, and six hens and then it's game on and you had no idea they were there. So um, we always try to take extra precaution when we're approaching the field edge and um, try to, I like to enter in them low spots like that, but Man, it sure does make it tough if they're if they're in a low spot or they're up over the crest of the field, um, shit like that. But just always try to be ready. And um, <laughs> if you make enough moves, you're gonna run into a silent bird like that, and uh, you're gonna be like, "Damn it!" Yeah. Um, my final one is a pack of Slim Jim. I got <laughs> there's that Slim Jim can literally save you on a turkey hunt. Sounds stupid, but it gives you. Something to look forward to eat, get you through the day, and then you're going to sit down and take a break when you eat that thing most of the time. You know what I mean? I don't know how many times we just kind of chilled and we sat down. And when you're turkey hunting, you're making so many moves nonstop if they ain't working. I feel like when you sit down and we can kind of talk about it, like we do deer hunting, you kind of slow the game down while you're, you know, having a snack basically. And be like, all right, what do you think we should do? Should we go to a different property? Should we go over here? Because most of the time it's like, move a hundred yards call, move a hundred yards mm. call, move a hundred card. I mean, it's just nonstop. So having that either pack a little food to take a break or just take a break and talk with your hunt buddy or even to yourself, like, okay, where should I be? Check the time. What, what have I had the best odds in the past? Um, that five minute break of kind of deciding what we should do. Just like last year when we kind of decide, should we walk all the way over there, all the way across this shit, and try to? And we end up getting on two birds. Yeah. The one in the middle that absolutely disappeared on us, that we must have busted, and then the one that was over there gobbling and damn near killed, could have killed, if it, but it wasn't on film. So, um, if we wouldn't have took that, that break and decided, hey, are we going to sit here and call these birds, or are we going to move around on this side, or are we going to go over there and and. Uh, I think it's real easy if you have a really good morning hunt and you don't get it done to be like, man, they're, they're here, they're here. And you just get stuck in that rut all day of trying to fire up the same birds. And you've already busted those birds and you don't know it or they're already with hens and they're quiet. Um, you got to get some fresh ideas and fresh birds, you know what I mean? Try to try to move on. So uh, pack a Slim Jim, you know what I mean? That's the, yeah, the reason I think about it is because you, you were out there eating that Slim Jim that one time we were sitting on the ground, you know what I mean? And, yeah. Um, and it's nice to recoup on those days. Like, all right, let's just chill. Think about it. Uh, cause it's, it doesn't seem like sunrise to one. It doesn't seem like a long time, but when you're out there, like we're like, we're at mile nine right now. <laughs> trying to fire up a bird. You know? <laughs> like, it, it takes a toll on you for sure. It does. I was just talking to Dusty today and I, cause he's been the last two mornings and, uh, it just took a half day and I was like, are you tired? And He's like, hell yeah, I'm tired. I was like, man, turkey tired is way different than deer tired. Turkey yeah. tired is, it's heavier. It's way heavier. You're just so, you're moving so much, man. You're always, you're always on the move when you're turkey hunting, dude. And you're always trying to, like you, deer hunting's more like a, a set up and make it happen, like be in the right spot. Turkey hunting's like, you, you, it ain't gonna happen unless you get <laughs> on fire. Yeah, really. You know, it's a, it's a different game, so. You can't hunt them like deer. You can if you know what your turkeys do real good. You can set up and stage on them. But us, it's like three miles over there, a mile and a half, a mile and a half back. We're back in the truck. We're driving around. We're at this property. We're going over here. And I know that's what it's going to be this year. It's like a – and then we'll fire one midday, and it won't work out. And then the next, like, it's just an ass whooping out there. You know what I mean? And, but, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to – just get out there and hunt and 
and hopefully watch you smash a bird. That's the main thing. You know, I just, I really like watching them come in, strut, gobble. I'm into that shit. I'm going to be really, really good at letting my kids kill turkeys. Giant deer, I don't know if I let my kids, <laughs> I want to kill the giant deer, but turkeys, I will let them murder them things. You know what I mean? And, and I feel like that's a really good thing to start kids on. Start letting them blast turkeys. You know, that's perfect. Yeah. So, uh, that's, that's my last thing on here is, uh, don't get, don't get real tied up in the game. Um, turkey hunting is one of the absolute best times to get your kids out way different than deer hunting. The birds are gobbling, um, get them in a blind, let them see the action. And then you'll know if they're into it or not from, from the rip. If they don't like turkey hunting, they are not going to like deer hunting because it's way slower game. <laughs> yeah. You know I mean, so, uh, but I had that wrote down. Just don't, um, don't, don't let the, you know, the urge to kill keep you from taking your kids out and, and just let them experience some gobbling on the tree. Like, I mean, that's, that's cool in itself. They probably never heard a turkey gobble like that. And the birds are chirping, the sun's coming up. They're out there in the dark. Like, I mean, it's, I remember when I went on my first turkey hunt, it's such a magical experience. You know, you're, you're following your dad. You think he's got it all figured out. You probably <laughs> don't know what the hell he's doing. You're out there in the dark. You pick a random tree. He picked a random tree, but you're like, all right, my dad knows this is the tree we're going to kill on. You know what I mean? Yeah. He let you set the decoy up and, you probably set it up wrong and it's going to fall over the first wind blow. Yeah. I mean, it's just those, I remember those memories, turkey hunting and uh, just the, the first memories I have are turkey hunting. You know, it's just something that it's, I think there's less stress to turkey hunting than deer hunting. Um, some people take it hella serious, but there's way less stress for me. Um, turkey hunting. And if you're having a bad season, don't pass it, Jake. I'm saying it right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can hate me. We'll smash. You can hate me if you want, but if you're in my woods, don't pass it, Jake. <laughs> smash that sucker, bro. <laughs> uh, right, you got anything else, homie? Yeah, one last thing is like uh, decoys. Uh, I feel like I'll, I'll take them with me a couple times, and then I'll feel like that they burn me. So then I won't take them, and then I'll have a hunt where I'm like, Man, I wish I had the decoys out there, you know. So, uh, just my just my personal opinion on decoys, it's 50-50. Uh, I'm usually yeah. taking them and got some, something set up. Um, had have had a lot, a lot of success with uh, having a hen out there with a Jake, not necessarily a full strutter decoy in the decoy um, spread, but definitely a Jake out there with the hen um, is has been a lot more fire for me versus um just having a strutter so yeah that just goes back to knowing your birds man if your birds decoy good bring the decoys if yeah. they're timid on decoys like your your property's kind of 50 50 some of them are like ah on the decoys some of them love them it's yeah like, it's they, they, could, they could give a shit less about that decoy out there you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah but some of them will come running right in so um i think turkey hunting is also just a day-to-day -day thing like you catch one tom on one day he's hell he's fired up yeah. ready to die you know and the next day he's like well i don't really know about this shit <laughs> i was kind of loose out there yesterday I better, I better tighten her up today <laughs> yeah all That's right it, guys man. well we hope you yeah hope you enjoyed this uh turkey talk um not something that we uh do a lot on this uh, white tail podcast but we uh, appreciate you guys tuning in um i was talking to a guy today about this and he was like you have a podcast and he just thought it was the craziest thing i'm like Bro, it's about the most bullshit setup you ever see in your life. <laughs> Don't be impressed by it. Like, we're just out here trying to, to kill shit and have as much fun as possible and talk about it with people on this show. So, Hell yes. Um, we appreciate you guys tuning in to just absolutely two nobodies that have no name in the industry at all um, every week. Um, if you listen this long, we love you. And uh, you got anything else, homie, before I wrap it up? I'm ready to smash a turkey this weekend. Hell yeah, dude. I'm ready to get out there, dude. This is going to release, and we're going to be in the woods this weekend. I'm, I'm ready. Hopefully, Brittany's is just a gangbusters Loaded. of feathers and spurs. And Are you bringing a gun? Everywhere. Are you bringing a gun, too? No. I don't have second season tag. Oh, I thought you had second, third, and fifth. I got third and fifth. I don't have second. Oh, okay. okay. Third and fifth, yep. Right. I got – I messed up on the – 
I thought I was buying a bunch of different tags, but I put one tag in for every season as options. Oh. <laughs> that was on me. Gotcha. The, that, that the was new the... online out of Kansas thing has really messed me up, <laughs> uh, for sure. But, gotcha. Uh, yeah, normal bullshit stuff for me. Absolute disaster. Barely making it by, but crushing it when it matters. Here that's, we go. That's my stop. So, all right, guys, we love you. Um, always try to do the right thing. Try to leave a legacy, and white till legacy is out. <laughs>